We'll go ahead and start here. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, there's, a, there's an old children's song about an old lady who inexplicably and for, uh, uh, for reasons that we don't completely understand, against her own self-interest, she swallows a fly. Um, the, the lyrics of the song go on to say something like, I, uh, there was an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. And uh, ultimately, she ends up swallowing a, a whole bunch of other animals, each intended to flush out the uh, previously swallowed ones. And then she kind of, uh, she, she, she does die eventually, and that's the end of the story. I'm sorry to ruin it for you, but um, she does that by swallowing a horse. And so, obviously, this is a cautionary tale uh, that, 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 that teaches the young children, or perhaps adults, to not pile stupid decisions on top of other ones. So an original, an original problem, don't try to fix it with a more complicated solution, so to speak. And that's exactly where we find ourselves today in our cities. Our cities, in, in regards to transportation policy, have, um, have piled problems on top of other problems. And so, uh, without any further ado, I present to you the old lady in six acts. Uh, act one, the fly. So we're swallowing the fly, the initial sin, um, idolizing the car. Today, um, our transportation, the, the futuristic transportation um, that, that, that we see is uh, kind of dominated by these really high-tech things like the Elon Musk's Hyperloop, uh, driverless automobiles, electric cars, flying cars, all this stuff. But it wasn't that long ago that we had an equally sexy um, uh, American icon, and that's the personal automobile. And so at some point, we decided to, to make a wholesale adoption of, of this as our mode of transportation, our, our one single mode of choice, and that's the fly. And so what did we do? We swallowed a spider to catch the fly. Um, and the spider, in this case, is speeding up the car, making it easier for us to get around in our, in our personal automobiles. And I just want to make sure that you understand that there's a difference between what I'm talking about mostly today, which is a local street, versus a road. So those two things are different, and why it's important to know that those are different is simply because one of our major missteps is that we've decided to try to kind of combine the two into one and expect it to work really well. So first, a road it, it looks something like this. The, uh, the idea of a road is to connect two places, place A to place B. You drive your car on that road, and it's one option, perhaps, of many to get from place A to place B. Um, but that's what it's for. A street, however, is intended to circulate people to, once you get to place B, you park your car, or maybe you continue driving it, but you park your car, or um, you hop out, you walk, you ride a bike, you hop on a train, whatever. Um, the, the idea is that these streets circulate people within that place. Um, but unfortunately, we've, we've adapted, we've, we've mashed up the two concepts into, into one single thing called a, uh, some call it a strode, uh, others call it a car sewer, which is my favorite one. Um, car sewer gives you a really good visual <laughs> on, on what, a, what a strode or uh, what I'm talking about here. But it's intended to just move people in and out really fast. And uh, it's been really detrimental for our cities. This is a shot of Kansas City, downtown, 1906. This is the same place today. So you can see that this, this idea um, of, of shuttling people in and out of our uh, cities has really been uh, problematic for our cities. Um, and then also our, our, our roadways, I'm kind of stepping back to roads, but they went from something like this, it was nice and tree-lined, to a place where they've denuded the landscape of, of all trees for our safety so that we can speed up more comfortably and uh, presumably safer. And so what did we do? Well, we swallowed a bird to catch the spider. And what does the bird, what's the bird about? It's controlling the car. Since we sped it up, we've got to make sure we keep it in check somehow. And the reason for that is cars kill lots of people. And you look at this graph here, and I'll try to use a laser pointer without um, shutting off my presentation. Um, this, is, this is traffic fatalities per capita in the United States. Cars kill a lot of people. Um, where it started here, of course, was early 20th century when we started driving places. And it really went up because we didn't know what the hell we were doing when we started driving. We jumped ahead, evolutionarily speaking. We, did, we weren't equipped, our brains are not equipped to drive 50 or 60 plus miles per hour, so we started dying a lot. Um, and then you see a drop here. That's World War II. A lot of people who were the drivers were overseas fighting in a war. 
Um, and then it kind of popped back up and leveled out for a while. And um, you'd see another spike in the early 1960s there. That's when we really started shifting our priorities to the automobile. And it wasn't really until this drop here, what you see now, that's great. That's great. That means that, that per capita our traffic fatalities are going down. But the reason why that is the case is simply because we started requiring stricter standards in our automobiles, not in our streets. Um, so it wasn't until seat belts, until child restraints in cars for babies and, and young children uh, that we have arrived where we are today, which um, still currently we're right about, in terms of absolute numbers, we're about 30 to 40,000 traffic fatalities a year. It's still the leading cause of death for, uh, uh, for children under the age of, or for people under the age of 20 in the United States. Um, so what did we do? How did we, um, how did we control the car? Well, we came up with this Bible that says this is how we control the car. We create these artificial barriers, these signs and traffic signals and all that stuff uh, in order to, like I said, create an artificial barrier. It's not an engineered design. It's something like a speed limit. So we're back to this one where it's a wide open street. It looks like a freeway. Um, this, is not a, this, is a, this is a wide open uh, road. But for whatever reason, the engineers thought a 45 mile per hour speed limit is appropriate there. Now, I don't know about you, but I would feel comfortable. Comfortable, not necessarily safe. There's, those are, that's a dis, there, there's a distinction there. Um, I feel comfortable driving 75 miles per hour on that, but there's some reason why we should be driving 45. We don't know that. There's not enough information here to make us understand that. And so rather than designing the roadway to be safer to accommodate for that 45 mile per hour speed, we've put an artificial barrier and put the onus onto traffic enforcement, enforcement of, of a traffic law. And then, of course, everyone needs to remember the children. Please think of the children. We put a speed limit sign in a school zone. Um, we've plopped our schools down on these car sewers, and we've expect, we expect people to adhere to that traffic, uh, that, that speed limit, in the, in the, uh, um, just hoping that people will naturally kind of fall into place. And so, uh, again, this is putting the onus on to traffic laws, artificial barriers. And then I don't know if my video is going to work, but that's okay. I don't really care. I don't need it. This is a traffic signal. Um, you, can, you can see all the traffic that you're going to see in this video if it, just from looking at this still image. There are, what this is is I waited at a stoplight. I, I stopped before I, I started recording. I was driving. I didn't, I didn't do it while I was driving. Um, but I, I, I spent a minute there at a red light, one minute. Wasting gas, wasting my, oh, there it is. Um, so I want you to count the cars that go through here uh, while we talk about this. But the point of this is that that traffic signal probably cost the uh, city of Kansas City. This is downtown Kansas City at rush hour on Friday, by the way. This isn't a Sunday afternoon. This is rush hour on Friday, despite what the, oh, there's one, two. All right, I think there's another one coming soon. But we spent probably 100,000, oh, a pedestrian. We spent, we spent uh, probably $100,000 or more on this traffic signal precisely because cars are going fast. It has nothing to do with volume, clearly. There's no cars going through it. Now what's happening is the, the, the cars coming at me have a left turn signal because it's obviously needed that they need a left turn signal. Uh, so uh, just, just think about this every time you stop at a, uh, for an unnecessarily long, unnecessarily long time at a red light, that you could probably get away without it if we accommodated, for our, uh, accommodated our streets and designed our streets a little differently. Um, so instead of input, imposing these artificial barriers like traffic, traffic laws and traffic signals, um, instead we, put, uh, we, we designed our streets to be safe in the beginning. Um, so what did we do about uh, the previous animal? We, we, we swallowed some goats, two goats in this case, and they're ramming their heads against each other. And this is probably what you feel like when you're trapped in, uh, in traffic sometimes. This is, this is like an animal representation, a dramatization of, uh, of, of uh, road rage. And so what, what's this all about? The, the, this is get more cars. How do we get more cars? Well, we plan for cars. We've, we've created this self-fulfilling prophecy of if we have all, we, we've got to accommodate for all these cars that are eventually coming. And then what we do is we, we induce that. We induce that demand. So um, there's this thing called induced demand. Uh, it's a fairly well-documented um, it's a fairly well documented phenomenon in which we as a society respond to traffic congestion on a particular roadway or a street or whatever. And so we add capacity, we add an extra lane, we make it easier for people to get around, we add extra parking. Uh, and 
what ends up happening is that congestion that we are trying to relieve uh, uh, comes back. The, the benefits of the roadway expansion are short-lived. And so we end up getting more and more cars. And where do those come from? Well, there's a few things. Uh, sometimes a desired outcome of a capital improvement, if you can even call it an improvement, um, of a roadway expansion or adding, adding lanes to a street is adjacent development. And so a developer comes in, builds a strip mall, adds 1,000 jobs, and then the local, the, the local elected officials tout it as a, as a great success, a public-private partnership in which the, the public sector footed the bill for a, a street expansion and the driver access to that strip mall. And so they say, oh, it's 1,000 new jobs, but let's be honest, those aren't new jobs, those are displaced jobs because they came from the strip mall that's slightly less shiny uh, a couple miles down the, the car sewer. And so uh, those, that's, that's one place where the demand comes from. The other thing is that the, the trips seem to materialize out of nowhere because they don't, elsewhere in the network, the system, the transportation system, the, uh, the traffic doesn't go down, the congestion doesn't get reduced. And so it's, uh, um, what, we've in that, what we've ultimately done is we've just encouraged people to drive more, to drive to go to the grocery store to get a gallon of milk, to hop off the bus instead of riding the bus they now drive because the, the bus can't even come close to competing with driving. And so we just encourage more trips and then the congestion comes back and it never goes back. And so it's this vicious, awful cycle, which brings us to the horse, paying for all of this stuff. Um, we're trapped in what uh, Chuck Marone of strongtowns.org calls the growth Ponzi scheme. We're, we're influenced by developers and by heavy contractors to spend money on these, uh, these improvements, again, these capital improvements, in order to get stuff in return. And so uh, I know that I talk, I said that I'm talking mostly about local streets and I'm kind of giving highways a pass, but this one was too, this example is just too rich to pass up. Um, this is what the Kansas Department of Transportation calls the Johnson County Gateway. It's got a nice little logo and everything down here. Some of you have probably heard of it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an improvement in the interchange uh, of the several freeways down uh, in southeast Johnson County. And at the cost of $600 million, $600 million, let that sink in, $600 million, what could we do with that other than build more space for cars? But, it, but at a cost, let, let's, just, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt that we actually need that $600 million interchange. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but before, oh, it does, awesome. So what, is the, what are the reasons? What are the reasons for the need for this 600? Well, one of them in their executive summary uh, says severe congestion levels exist on uh, both AMP and peak hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, today, 20% of the interchange is congested. A drive through the inter 20%, not 100%, not even 80%, 20% of it's congested. Um, now, let's, let's read on. The absurdity continues. A drive through the interchange that should take three minutes, three, actually takes on average of four minutes. Four. So we're saving drivers one minute to get to work or wherever they're going. One minute, we're spending $600 million. Well, there's got to be some other reasons. Well, here's another reason. 360,000 drivers are expected to go through this um, by the year 2040. So 300, that's a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's a lot of traffic. Currently, 230,000. That's a lot of cars that go through that interchange. But, but for this investment, this, this improvement, that number would not go to 360. We are inducing that demand. And of course, a consultant gave him this number, and that consultant stands to benefit from uh, these, these new engineering and uh, uh, improving this stuff. So uh, the people who are telling them these numbers are sometimes the ones who stand to benefit the most from actually implementing them. And so it's not just, it's not just this vicious cycle of, of induced demand, and then respond, and then induce demand, and respond. Um, Eventually, we're going to pave the whole state of Kansas, I suppose, when the, when the, the demand on that keeps going up. But um, it's also on the maintenance. It's, this stuff costs money to maintain. And you've probably, some of you have probably gone through downtown Kansas City recently and seen all of the, the maintenance that's going on. That's not improvement. That's maintenance that's causes it's snarling traffic, according to the Kansas City Star. Um, we, we have to maintain it, and that costs a lot of money. And so the American Society of Simple Engineers who stands, of course, to benefit a lot from a lot of these investments, um, says that if we spend $6.6 .6 trillion, the federal government, that is, 
stands to benefit, stands to get an, an increased, increased tax, an increased federal tax revenue, $540 billion. So in order to get $540 billion of tax, they have to spend $6.6 .6 trillion. I don't, I'm, I'm not the best mathematician, but that does not seem like a good return on investment. Um, so we have to spend a lot of money to basically get nothing in return. And again, that's the growth Ponzi scheme. Um, but it's not just the public debt. It's not just ringing, it's just not putting, it's not just putting cities bankrupt like Detroit. It's, it's hurting our private finances as well. $9,122. That is the cost of the average family sedan per year. So you spend on each car you own somewhere around 9000 on average, $9,000 a year. That is a heck of a lot of money. And imagine what that does to someone who, in order for them to get a job uh, at working at McDonald's or wherever, a low-wage job, just to get to the interview, they have to spend $9,000 a year to, to just make it to that interview and then, of course, to make it to, to work all the time. We have to do better. We have to provide alternative modes of transportation in order to make this uh, workforce equitable. So epilogue the purge. Let's throw these things up. Let's get rid of them. So let's just start with the horse, the big one. We'll go in reverse order. What can we do here? Well, throw up the horse means that we need to convince our local, state, and federal governments that they need to consider return on investment of these public uh, improvements. That there has to be some way that it pays for itself or comes close to paying for itself uh, through uh, ultimate, uh, through development ultimately. Because um, currently it's not, as you can see with that uh, graph from the American uh, Society of Civil Engineers. The goats, how can we get rid of the goats? Well, we diversify our portfolio. Um, if, if, if our transportation system was a investment for portfolio, it would look like we've invested all of our money into the stock of one single flagging uh, company. And that's any, if there are any financial advisors in here, they understand that that is not a very good financial policy. So we have to invest more in things like bicycling, more bicycling, pedestrian infrastructure, more sidewalks, and then uh, public transportation as well. So diversify it, um, and that's gonna help sort of uh, make a more equitable transportation system. And then the bird, let's get rid of the bird. That's an ugly looking bird anyway. Um, so let's throw it up, and let's, instead of controlling the car with these artificial barriers, let's, let's engineer our streets to be safe by design. Um, so here we've got, uh, this is a better block, what they call a better block here in Kansas City. There's another one coming up soon, but um, what's really cool about these is that um, they kind of transform a space that once was dismal into a nice park-like environment to, sh to show temporarily what that could look like if we made improvements. Um, more parklets, so let's, let's take some space back and give it to people and use it as a traffic calming uh, measure. And then the spider. Let's get rid of that awful brown recluse spider and um, let's, let's design our streets for, for people again. Let's flip the paradigm. Let's, instead of designing streets first and foremost for the speed of cars, let's, let's, make them, let's slow it down and, and, uh, and consider people again. And then the fly. The fly is sort of our own personal decision. We've got to get rid of this infatuation with the personal automobile. Um, bicycling, walking to school, uh, living closer to where we work. And all of this gets to one point, and that is our streets are some of our greatest, our greatest public asset, really. Our rights of way are, are a tremendous amount of, have a tremendous amount of value. And in order for us to get back, to turn our cities back into the cultural, vibrant places they once were, we have to start making human-scale transportation decisions in order to make human-scale cities. Thank you.